First of all, you tell me. Is there some society that you know of that doesn't run on greed? Hmm? You think Russia doesn't run on greed? Hmm? China. Hmm? You think China doesn't run on greed? What is greed? Well, of course, none of us are greedy. No, it is always the other fellow who is greedy. <laughs> Listen, the world runs on individuals pursuing their self-interests. The great achievements of civilization have not come from a government bureau. The only cases in which the masses have escaped from grinding poverty are where they have had free trade. And that is what we bring to them. Freedom. Choice. The first step is to sell the state-owned industries to the private sector in order to increase efficiency, productivity, and to ensure that maximum profit is made. A government has no idea how to make money. They are always concerned about getting the vote and how they will be seen and not about the economy. Privatize, privatize, privatize. That is the key. Yeah. Well, the following step is to put the free market economy into place. All previous government price controls are abolished. Businesses are finally given the freedom to set their own prices and import and export what they wish. The people are finally given the freedom to pursue their own self-interests and not someone else's. Next, in order to remove the deficit to the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, government-controlled social support must be cut. Pensions, education, Benefits are affected, yes. <clears throat> but who wants a humiliating debt on their shoulders? Now, the damage that that does to the pride of a nation is staggering. The fact is that the programs that are labeled as being for the poor, for the needy, almost always have effects exactly the opposite of those which their well-intentioned sponsors intend to have. Let me give you a very simple example. Take the minimum wage laws. With bad programs, you must always have an unholy alliance of the do on the one hand and the special interests on the other. The special interests are, of course, the trade unions who use the well-meaning sponsors as frontmen. The do believe that by passing a law saying nobody should get less than $2 an hour or whatever the minimum wage is, that you are helping <coughs> the poor people who need the money. <laughs> you are doing nothing of the kind. The minimum wage law is probably best described as a law saying employers must discriminate against people with low skills. Yeah. That's what the law says. The law says, here is a man who has a skill that would justify a wage rate of a dollar and a half, two dollars an hour. You may not. You cannot employ him. It is illegal. Because if you employ him, you have to pay him two fifty. So what's the result? Well, to employ him at 250 is to engage in charity. Not that there is anything wrong with charity, but most employers are not in a position to engage in this kind of charity. Thus, the consequences of minimum wage laws are almost wholly bad to increase unemployment and to increase poverty. So, what should we do with those who are displaced? 40 and 50 year old workers who for practical purposes really cannot be retrained to keep up with this new developing industry. Hmm, what can we do about it? No? Well, you see, nobody can take, nobody can accept the principle that an infinite value should be put on an individual life. To retrain those unemployed needs money. No. No, no, it isn't money. It's resources. And in order to get those resources, they have to come from somewhere. It cannot be accepted that a million people must starve in order to give one old worker a job. Now, mass unemployment only lasts for so long. We have to tolerate it. <laughs> Do you know what it takes to reshape an economy? No? A black market does develop. <sighs> It is an unavoidable occurrence in the economic transformation. However, it is nothing too serious. Alcohol, cigarettes, foreign currencies, minor human trafficking, 
things of that nature. Nothing that we are really concerned about. Hmm? Oh, it could always be worse. Nirvana is not for this world. There is no such thing as paradise. Crime happens wherever you go. Democracy never promised to banish crime. A reformed free market economy takes no responsibility over the maniacs, the psychopaths, and the murderers out there on the streets. We take no responsibility over the rise in homicide. At the same time that homicide is rising, the economy is soaring. Standards of living are at their highest in decades. This scene happened in 1991. Communism fell. Western capitalism rose. New Year's Eve. The family waited for the clock to strike midnight. Hope. marry a rich man. Do you like your earrings? Because he's rich and has lots of money. Do you like your new shoes? He can buy me beautiful dresses. A real woman. And love me. My woman. It's important to be loved. Beautiful. To know. You've never looked so beautiful before. That someone loves you. I'm glad I bought them. People can die when no one loves them. Very glad. Like plants. You need to get used to looking beautiful. And he'll have blue eyes. There's only opportunity ahead of us now. Like my doll. Only beautiful people in the future. I don't have blue eyes. It's going to get better. <laughs> but he'll buy me new ones. It's just a matter of waiting. And our children will have blue eyes. Our time has come to live life. We'll be so beautiful. Be happy. He can make me a queen. Live long. And queens are happy. <laughs> I'll get that promotion. Queens are. I can feel it. <laughs> beautiful. When all that foreign money comes flooding in. And queens never wait for anything. They're bound to promote me. And queens are always listened to. With how hard I work. And queens always get what they want. Back then. And thousands of people love them. Foreigners, the Westerners. Millions of people. They know how to run a business. <laughs> yeah. Profit. And my rich husband can do this. My own office. Because he will have lots of money. My own assistant. And money buys you nice dresses. <laughs> my name on the door. And nice hair and beautiful eyes. <laughs> and big houses. Castles and shiny cars. A car. And really nice bodies and happy smiles. I'll have to get a suit. And McDonald's. <laughs> and Coca-Cola. I'll be somebody. Every day. We should start by now. For breakfast. On credit. And lunch. Get it all on credit. And dinner and before I go to sleep. I'll pay it all off with the first pay rise. People love you when you're rich. Then we'll buy more. People know you and wave at you. That's what this new future is about. And take pictures of you. Profit. I want all of you to own a picture of me. <laughs> and fall in love with me. But I will only love my rich husband because he's rich <laughs> and beautiful. I love you. Ding. Flying high, you know how I feel. Sun in the sky, you know how I feel. Breeze just drifting on by, you know how I feel. It's a new dawn, it's a new day, it's a new life for me. And I'm feeling good. Fish in the sea, 
You know how I feel River running free You know how I feel Blossom on the tree You know how I feel It's a new dawn It's a new day It's a new life for me and I'm feeling good Stars when you shine You know how I feel Scent of the pine You know how I feel Yeah, freedom is a mine And I know how I feel it's a new dawn, it's a new day, it's a new life for me. And I'm feeling... This scene happened in 1992. Deregulated price controls. The student, the pawnbroker, a hard bargain. What do you want? A watch? I have a watch to sell. You ran out of money again. Yeah. I'm paying rent now for the roof over my head. It's been a rough few weeks. I need to eat. But the watch? <clears throat> I have a watch to sell? My father's. He left me this. Yeah. Just need a little something to keep me going till everything gets back on its feet. Good. You're the student of law. Uh -huh. How is business these days? Fruitful. <laughs> Fruitful, yes. Incredible. The economy's really blossoming, huh? Mm. <laughs> I'm sure things will pick up very soon. For the rest of us. Just running a little low at the moment, but only for the moment. I'll catch up. Well, that's why you're here. Yes. The ring. Last month. Time went up yesterday to redeem it. It's a good job you came. I'll bring you interest in advance for last month. Just wait. This watch? I decide whether I sell or buy your pledge. I decide you don't. Understand? Yes. You owe me for last month. I'll bring you. Show me. Solid silver. Perfect working condition. Antique. Yeah, generations old. It is working. So, what do you want for it? 25, I believe, is a very modest. I know this watch is worth more Do than... Do you? Yes. And as I said, I'm struggling to keep everything afloat. Nobody wants private lessons anymore. I'm not in the right business. Not getting as much work as I'd like. 25 would save me. The value of silver has dropped. No, it hasn't. It has now, my dear boy. <laughs> I'll pay your interest in advance for last month in a few days. 19? Please. Seven. Even lower. I lost my job. I'll be evicted. You Please. Can end this business for love. There's no room for love under this roof. Please. No one's in business to just get by anymore. I want to get rich. I want to grow and grow and grow. Don't you? So I decide my prices. I decide when silver rises in value or drops. Hungry. I have money, yes? So you can sell, and I can buy, and you can eat, and I can put a little something in my pocket. And sell when silver goes back up again. It must be a wonderfully liberating time to be in business for you. It is. So, do you want to keep that roof over your head or sleep in the street? Ten? 
with this turn in. Charlotte, your shoes. Yeah, I have some more at home. These are in great condition. Real leather. Dan, if you clean them. So, 45% of the interest rate will be per month here before the half of the time period of the plans about for the Nanella before you know me before I set it before I buy time, I save my half in touch. Now we can afford to pay me interest, so I take it straight away. So, here's your 150. 150? So, 45% of the interest rate will be per month here before the half of the time period of the plans about for the Nanella before you know me before I set it before the buy time, I take my half in total. No one can afford to pay me interest, so I take it straight away. So, here is your 150. You run a hard bargain. You're what this economy needs. Mm. With strong-minded women like you, the economy will be rocketing in no time. I hope we don't see each other again. Seen happen in 1992. Privatization, mass unemployment, alcoholism. The unemployed man returned home. Debt, charity, suicide.
teeth sunk into our own arms because we've had nothing to eat. Drinking. Where is the money? Answer me. Who are you? What are you doing here? Where is our money? Where is the money? Where is the money? No. 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 We have debt. I had no idea. You're jobless. He's going to kill us. He's going to kill us. All we had left was that little. Three days we haven't eaten. Do you want to see? Say hello to Daddy. Say, Daddy, why did you run away? Say, Daddy, why did you steal the money from the box? Tell your Daddy what the gangster did to Mummy. Tell him that after you ran away, Daddy, the gangster burst through the door, tore Mummy's earrings from her ears, and scared the gangster! Tore out those earrings. Fucked me in the kitchen. Gagged me with your debt. Whispering in my ear how much you had born. All those things that went missing. You never told me that we were missing. You needed the money from somewhere. I needed the money from somewhere, so I began to pay and borrow. It was easy. So easy, but I couldn't pay him back. The redundancy was worth nothing, nothing for us to live up to. I tried to ignore him, borrow from somewhere else to pay him back, but the interest, all his promises I made to you, to my little girl. I wish she was happy. You were happy. I mean, what were you, somebody? I had to do something. I didn't think he would come here. I was scared he would kill me. Okay. We knew that would be hardships. Everything's going to get better. Can you hear me? You'll see. Unemployment is going to be a temporary thing. We have to tolerate it. The economy is there for us. Freedom. Choice. Leave. Leave. The unemployed man threw himself in front of the lorry on the motorway.
Some people say a man is made out of might. A poor man's made out of muscle and blood. Muscle and blood and skin and bones. A mind that's weak and a back that's strong. Sixteen times. And what do you get? Another day older and deeper in death. St. Peter, don't you call me, cause I can't go. I owe my soul to the company store. And I, I was born one day in the sun and shine. I picked up my shovel and I walked to the mine. I loaded 16 tons of number nine coal. And the straw boss said, well, bless my soul, you load 16 tons. And what do you get? Another day older and deeper in death. St. Peter, don't you call me, cause I can't go. I owe my soul to the company store. And I, I was born one day and it was drizzling rain. Fighting and trouble, all my middle names. I was raised in the Cambridge by no mama lying. Ain't no high tone woman. Make me toe the line, you load 16 tons, and what do you get? Another day older and deeper in death. St. Peter, don't you call me, cause I can't go. I owe my soul to the company store. And if you see me coming, better step aside. A lot of men did and a lot of men died with one fist of iron and the other of steel. If the right one don't get you, then the left one will. You load 16 tons. And what do you get? Nigh oh my soul at your company store. This scene happened in nineteen ninety two. Pensions cut. The paranoid mother, the dead father's shoes, the arranged marriage, nostalgia, delusion. No, you, uh, you can't take them. You can't take your father's shoes. This is all I have left. My life. You don't love me. You care more about a pair of shoes than about your son. Do you not love your father? You want to sell his shoes? My last memory of him? Mama? Yeah? He's dead, Mama. He doesn't need them anymore. I need them. Where is sister? You left to come back and beg from your poor mother. Look at what you and your generation have done. With all your dreams for change, for the revolution. Always wanting more. It has left me with nothing. A generation of beggars. Why were you happy to live like an animal with whatever the state gave you straight from their hand, never looking up from your trough? I can't understand that, Mama. How about you now? What do you have? Anything to eat? Do you even have a trough to look up from? A beggar? My son. This is what your new future has brought you. At least back then we had something to count on. This new world of yours has only brought me tears. Cold hunger. Where is she? I'm going to hang up. Mama, You're Mama, killing me. Mama, Mama, please. Where is sister? You're killing me. <sighs> Goodbye. No, Mama, Mama, Mama. You're right. 
I haven't got anything to eat. I haven't had a sip of tea. I'm starving. I need the money, Mama. I'll die. Hungry. Homeless. Help me! My baby. My poor baby. What have I done? Uh, what happened to our family? Where is she? I'll ask her for money. If you can't bring yourself to give me anything. She's marrying a rich man. She she hopes he will help both of us get back on our feet. Please insert another coin. Baby? Mama? <laughs> Please insert another coin. She what you said? She's marrying a rich Please man. She wanted coin. to marry him. Of course, she doesn't love him. Please insert uh, another coin. She loves me and, and she loves you. Please insert what another else coin. What else could we have done? Please insert another coin. She's, she's the same. Send me the shoes. Please insert another coin. My pension was cut with your hopes for change. <laughs> what else could I have done? We have no choice. I'm dying. I will be dead soon. I want to die in a warm room. You have anything to eat? Please forgive me. Forgive me. Do you understand why? Do you understand why? Do you understand why? They've taken it all. What else could I have done? visit me, he can buy a drink ticket. Please take the shoes. Thank you. happened in 1993. Still in debt, the child is sold. Money, food, a civil handshake. There was the single mother, ill. child aged it happened in a filthy room the single mother assisted the child in drinking a glass of vodka The consumer. The consumer.
consumer gave the single mother a bag of McDonald's food and a small roll of foreign currency. The single mother counted the money. The single mother confirmed to the consumer that all was in check. The single mother pointed to the child. And the consumer went over to her timidly. The single mother walked away, but watched like a bouncer. The consumer undressed the child and began to molest her. The single mother set a timer. The consumer raped the child. The single mother ate. child maintained a sense of professionalism despite the pain she felt.
it took a very long time. timer went off. The consumer dressed himself and left. <coughs> the child went to the McDonald's bag and ate. Everybody knows the dice are loaded. Everybody rolls with their fingers crossed. Everybody knows the war is over. Everybody knows the good guy is lost. Everybody knows the fight was fixed. The poor stay poor. The rich get rich. That's how it goes. Everybody knows. And everybody knows the boat is leaking. Everybody knows the captain lied. Everybody's got this broken feeling like their father or their dog just died. Everybody's talking to their pocket. Everybody wants a box of chocolate and a long-stemmed rose. Everybody knows. And everybody knows you love me, baby. Everybody knows you really do. Everybody knows that you've been faithful. 
give or take a night or two. Everybody knows you've been discreet. But there were so many people you just had to meet without your clothes. Everybody knows. And everybody knows. Everybody knows. That's how it goes. Everybody knows. And everybody knows. Everybody knows. That's how it goes. Everybody knows. And everybody knows it's now or never. Everybody knows it's me or you. Everybody knows you live forever, or when you've done a line or two. <laughs> and everybody knows the deal was rotten. Old Black Joe's still picking cotton for your ribbons and bows. Everybody knows. And everybody knows a plague is coming. Everybody knows it's moving fast. Everybody knows the naked man and woman are just a shining artifact of the past. And everybody knows the scene is dead. But there's going to be a meter on your bed that will disclose what everybody knows. And everybody knows that you're in trouble. Everybody knows what you've been through. From the bloody cross on top of Calvary and to the beach at Malibu. <laughs> and everybody knows it's coming apart. Don't we? don't we? Take one last look at this sacred heart before it blows. Everybody knows. And everybody knows. Everybody knows. That's how it goes. Everybody knows. And everybody knows, yeah, everybody knows, that's how it goes. Everybody knows, and everybody knows, everybody knows, that's how it goes. Everybody knows, and everybody knows. Yeah, everybody knows That's how it goes Everybody knows Join in Everybody knows Everybody knows That's how it goes Everybody knows And everybody knows Yeah Everybody knows that's how it goes. Sorry. <laughs> oh, everybody knows. You're the words. Everybody knows. Everybody knows that's how it goes. Everybody knows. Last chance. Everybody knows. Everybody knows that's how it goes. Everybody knows. Yeah. <laughs> this scene happened in 1993. Rising homicide. The homeless student. The pawnbroker. Promise of gold. The murder, the speech. Who is it? I have something to sell. <laughs> Who is it? The student. Why are you here? I have something to sell. Without a doubt. 
gold. I have gold. How are you? Thank you. There's something wrong. Why? I'm sweating. Oh, around here. I was afraid you might be sleeping. Is it gold? Um, yeah. Here it is. Where did you get this from? I forgot I owned it. What is it? Cigarette case. Take a look. Please. It's so tightly wrapped. I was afraid it might rain. I'm too tired, but it must be a fit. Please. Where's the light? Wave your hand. Wink. Shout. Ah. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Laugh. <laughs> Cry. I need to know I'm being listened to. I need to know that you know this was not a crime. It's very important you tell me you agree with me that she was the one who was committing the crimes. Yeah? I thought you understand why I'm here. Why I did this. Why I threw everything away. The free market is there to help people. 
but she was abusing it. I killed this pig. To bring it to light. With my hands hold up high for you to see. To examine. To sit and discuss in the bar afterwards with a glass of wine and a disillusioned heart. But it was her who was the criminal. Do you agree? You can discuss it now if you want. You don't have to wait. She was a criminal. Me? Why? What am I? Don't tell anyone. I promise. I believe in the Western truth. I believe wholly in the importance of self-interest. So why have I ended up here? Lights. Lights. Please. Lights. Can you do it? The tyrant is dead. Greed is dead. They won't abuse us any longer. Light. Operator, turn on the light. Turn on the lights. No. Please. No. Someone next to you. What do you mean? I, mean I need the lights, Nico. I can't give you lights. I can't find the money. We need the money. Her money. The student tried to leave the apartment, but kept slipping in the blood. Rape me, rape me, my friend, rape me, rape me again. I'm not the only one, I'm not the only one, I'm not the only one. I'm not the only one Waste me Do it and do it again Hate me Rape me again I'm not 
the only one. I'm not the only one. I'm not the only one. I'm not the only one. My favorite inside source. I kiss your open sores. I appreciate your concern. They'll always think and burn. I'm not the only one. 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 I'm not the. Well, first of all, you tell me. Is there some society you know of that doesn't run on greed? You think Russia doesn't run on greed? You think China doesn't run on greed? What is greed? Well, of course, none of us are greedy. No, it is always the other fellow who is greedy. Listen, the world runs on individuals pursuing their self-interests. The great achievements of civilization have not come from a government bureau. The only cases in which the masses have escaped from grinding poverty are where they have had free trade. And that is what we bring to them. Freedom. Choice. The first step is to sell the state-owned industries to the private sector in order to increase efficiency, productivity, and to ensure that maximum profit is made. A government has no idea how to make money. They are always concerned about getting the vote and how they will be seen, and not about the economy. Privatize, privatize, privatize. That is the key. The following step is to put the free market economy into place. All previous government price controls are abolished. Businesses are given the freedom to set their own prices and import and export what they wish. The people are finally given the freedom to pursue their own self-interests and not someone else's. Next. In order to remove the deficit to the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, government-controlled social support must be cut. Pensions, education, benefits are affected, yes. But who wants a humiliating debt on their shoulders? No, the damage that that does to the pride of a nation is staggering. The fact is that the programs that are labeled as being for the poor, for the needy, almost always have effects exactly the opposite of those which their well-intentioned sponsors intend to have. Let me give you a very simple example. Take the minimum wage laws. With bad programs, you almost always have an unholy alliance of the do gooders on the one hand and the special interests on the other. The special interests are, of course, the trade unions who use the well-meaning sponsors as frontmen. The do-gooders believe that by passing a law saying nobody should get less than $2 an hour or whatever the minimum wage is, that you are helping the poor people who need the money. No. You are doing nothing of the kind.
The minimum wage law is probably best described as a law saying employers must discriminate against people with low skills. Well, that's what the law says. The law says... Here is a man who has a skill that would justify a wage rate of, uh, a dollar and a half. Two dollars an hour. You may not. You cannot employ him because it's illegal. Because if you employ him, you have to pay him two fifty. So what's the result? Excuse me? No? Well, to employ him at two fifty is to engage in charity. Not that there is anything wrong with charity, but most employers are not in a position to engage in this kind of charity. Thus, the consequences of minimum wage laws are almost wholly bad. To increase unemployment and to increase poverty. So what should we do with those who are displaced? 40 and 50 year old workers who for practical purposes really cannot be retrained to keep up with this new developing industry. Hmm? What can we do about it? We see nobody can take, nobody can accept the principle that an infinite value should be put on an individual life. To retrain those unemployed needs money. No, no, it isn't money, it's resources. And in order to get those resources, they have to come from somewhere. It cannot be accepted that a million people must starve in order to give one old worker a job. Mass unemployment only lasts for so long. We have to tolerate it. Do you know what it takes to reshape an economy? No. The black market does develop. It is an unavoidable occurrence in the economic transformation. However, it is nothing too serious. Alcohol, cigarettes, foreign currencies, minor, minor human trafficking, things of that nature. Nothing that we are really concerned about. It could always be worse. Nirvana is not for this world. There is no such thing as paradise. Thank you. such thing as paradise. Crime happens wherever you go. Democracy never promised to banish crime. A reformed free market economy takes no responsibility for the maniacs, the psychopaths, and the murderers out there on the streets. We take no responsibility over the rise in homicide. At the same time that homicide is rising, the economy is soaring. Hmm? Oh. Hmm? Standards of living are at their highest in decades. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. I hope you get home safely and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to the last session of the second edition of Blood, Political Theatre as a Civil Right, a fortnightly online platform presenting political theatre from around the world, hosted by HowlRound Creative Theatre Commons.
My name is Nico Vakari. I am a co-artistic director and co-founder of Vesna Theatre, a British Romanian political theatre collective committed to using theatre to investigate, expose and confront institu institutionalised and normalised violences. I also wrote and directed Crime, the show that was streamed this evening. Thank you so much for joining us. For tonight's discussion, we are joined by three wonderful panellists and very special human beings, each of which has had a tr transformative impact on Besner Theatre. So to begin with, could each of you please introduce yourselves? Let's start with you, Matt. Hello, um, I'm Matthew Wernham. I played the student in the production um, and have worked with Besner since a couple of times now and we're about to start something else together, which I'm really excited about. Um, great to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Matt, and welcome. Um, Penny. Uh, hi, I'm Penny Green. I'm a professor of law and globalization and the founder of the and director of the International State Crime Initiative. So I work on not traditional forms of crime, but um, crimes committed by states. And so the production is really interesting to me um, from a structural perspective. Uh, and my association with Besner has been really enriching. And I've loved being able to work with Nico and Cinziana, but that's where I am. Thank you so much. Welcome, Penny and Angel. Hello, uh, I'm Angel, and uh, I, I'm, I was the child and the mother in the production of Crime. And I've been working with Besner since 2014, which this, this is sort of where the journey started for, for me and I guess for Besner as well. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, that's me. Thank you, Ankel. Welcome. Um, actually, on the back of that, um, I wanted to start with a question to uh, the two of you. Um, so at least for me, um, back in 2014, um, I often class, I class crime as a production that was kind of like a hallmark moment for, for Besna and me as an individual uh, in many, many ways. Um, it was the first time we traveled abroad and toured a show abroad as well after a London run. But also it was, I would, I would like, yeah, sincerely say that it was my first real attempt at like experimenting and trying to tackle what I, did, I was discovering as political theater. And so, to keep thing, so to open tonight's discussion, I just kind of wanted to ask both you, Ankel and uh, Matthew, um, like kind of what that experience generally was like for you. I mean, was it your first time uh, working with political theatre and like, what was that experience for you if it was, especially because we came from a classical training background? Um, I suppose, I mean, I think our training, obviously this, I don't know if it's um, obvious for everyone. I don't know if it says anywhere, but, you know, we started this production at drama school and we trained together um, at Drama Centre London. And I think that that training at the time had a particularly strong um, emphasis on, if, if not uh, politics, at least, what are you doing with your work? Or what do you want to achieve with your work? Um, and for me, working on this, I mean, the, the, working on this production was likewise for me a kind of real, a hallmark in the truest sense of the word in that it kind of really like has left a deep impression, you know, like it's been stamped into me somehow and it informs everything. I That process informs everything I do now. Um, and I think it was a, a drawing together of a lot of the things that we'd been testing in our training or kind of things that were hinted at. And I think that working with Unico was fantastic because you kind of, you kind of forced us <laughs> by hook or by crook to bring it all together and, 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 and to be quite um, sort of um, on uh uncompromising in many ways with what what is this about what are we serving this is something that is bigger than all of us um and it felt like it felt like 
I mean, the experience of actually doing the production itself and especially, you know, working in Romania and meeting people um, who maybe had a bit more of a direct memory or uh, experience of some of the some of the things that, that crime explores. It was like, oh, wow, like this this work does have a really, really vivid, immediate impact on people. And I think that, you know, working with you since that idea of uh, theater as protest or something, you know, this you can feel in this production the seeds of that. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, Angel, sorry. Yeah, uh, well, I can I can only uh, sort of reinforce what you said, and I agree with everything. For me, the process was uh, life changing, like artistically and I guess ex existentially, uh, <laughs> and yeah, because. Um, that was sort of the first time that I felt connected to an idea uh, and in the deepest way where where things just had to happen on stage. Obviously, well, not obviously, but the process was, uh, how, does, how to describe it, but uh, the process was life-changing in a way as well, but it was quite tough and uh and hard in a way to get where we got by the time we were in Romania or by the time we opened the, the show and I think that what was beautifully about this show what was beautiful about this show is that uh we sort of constantly changed with it um but only reinforcing the ideas behind it um yeah and uh well, it, I, I mean, I, I don't know if it has the same Im impact on me than the audience, but I, I am, I am certain it, it probably does because, uh, I've, I've never seen it as an audience. Well, I, I saw it, the, I saw the recording, but uh, I'm, I'm still hit as a performer there and then, um, and, and I'm, and yeah, I mean, this, this work and this play uh, completely informs uh, what I do artistically today uh, and it's sort of a, a bar that I have set into I'm now starting to sort of direct and write and stuff and it's a high bar you know it's a high bar Nico uh, <laughs> So, it's yeah. still a bar for me as well, you know, in many respects. Uh, the way I work, I think, with Besna has evolved from that amazing uh, point. It's evolved in many ways, but there are still certain aspects, many aspects, in fact, of crime that I look back on and go, actually, there was something, we did something there, you know. Um, and I do want to come back to this idea later on uh, about the audience, uh, because I actually, having, you know, watched it every single night and I, even operating it uh, and doing everything, I had a lot of, um, I have a lot of memories of like the, the audience and different audiences interacting with the show and stuff, but we'll come on to that a little bit later. Um, so it's an adaptation of the first part of Dostoevsky's like really famous novel, Crime and Punishment, uh, which I was always struck by how relevant it was today. And I think this show was my first kind of like concrete, I would say activist activity and kind of like exploring and trying to deconstruct maybe in a crude sense, uh, capitalism and trying to understand class, trying to understand, um, I think even retrospectively after doing the show, how violent economic policies can actually be. Um, and even though it was set in Russia and we set it in contemporary, um, more contemporary uh, Russia post 91 when communism fell, there was still a lot of, I could relate to a lot, even though in terms of the area that I grew up in and seeing austerity, et cetera, et cetera. And Penny, I wanted to come to you um, with a question about kind of like, as one of the, you know, most renowned and kind of leading voices on state crime, I was very curious, Jenna, I'm going to give you a first very generalized question of like, uh, from your perspective of, uh, of state crime, how did you see the show? Like, obviously we tried to stage it in like a series of crimes, that 
directly or indirectly were maybe influenced by economic policy. But I'm just very curious about your immediate response. Oh, thanks, Nico. Well, I think it's an amazing show. I, I found it hard to watch. I mean, I'm sure I'm sure we're talking coming back to the audience. It's a tough watch. And uh, and I guess that's that's the intention. And it should be because it's it's trying to get to the core of what is wrong with capitalism in the way in which it reaches out and touches us all. So it's I mean, you know, when I was a, a, a young activist, the, you know, the, the personal is political and, and clearly the political is personal. And, and the film, I, the, the play, I'm sorry, I watched it on screen. The play really captures, I think, the structural nature of, the, the, the sort of the, the structural violence of capitalism um, and the way it inflects crime so that you have the, the, the petty examples of crime that the individuals in your play uh, engage in, you know, theft and, and violence. And I'm, when I say petty, I, it's, it, they aren't petty for the individual victims who are involved, but if we can contrast it to what states and corporations do, um, and, and the, the sexual violence and the exploitation of, of, of the daughter and so on. But these are the products, these are the criminal products of a deeply criminal system. And I think that that comes across uh, really powerfully. Um, I think there are, there are two ways of looking at um, state crimes. You can look at the, the, the crimes that, that that states engage in in order to advance particular uh, strategic goals, particular or particular organizational goals. And we see a lot of the prosecution of war, for example, and, um, and torture and so on. But then there's something deeper, um, which as a criminologist, we might not always describe as crime because then everything about capitalism is criminal. <laughs> So, but but we we can we can begin to look at the structures of capitalism and the way that capitalism relies on fractures between classes. It relies on exploitation. It relies on violence. And so, there's something very fundamentally criminal about the system. Um, so, there are two ways that we approach, I suppose, state crimes. And and much of the work we do are the, is is in relation to actually very specific. Um, breaches that states engage in, um, breaches from their own, if you like, proclaimed rules and regulations that they expect all of us to abide by. And in the, the play, you have individuals breaching those rules and regulations and laws um, that have been imposed by a very criminal state and by a very criminal system or a system which has criminality at its very core. And when I talk about criminality, state criminality, we're talking really about violence and corruption, primarily. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I guess actually retrospect, because I was still, as when we were making the show, I think, I don't know, I can't speak for Ankel or Matthew, but I certainly, I think the making of the show was part of my own process of understanding capitalism. I didn't read a little bit of reading before and stuff, but like, I think, yeah, it's certainly in retrospect, it, I'm glad that even like six years on, it still comes across as like the structural violence. And actually I have to say that actually is down to Dostoevsky because we adapted his novel and even like that was written over a hundred years ago and he was writing in the feudal system, which to be quite honest, there are arguably in general terms, there's very little difference between the feudal system and capitalism as we know it today in many respects. Um, and what always struck me is the students kind of, but he holds on to the last, last moment of his belief in the new freedom. And that no, no, it has to work. It has to work, regardless of that, the fact that with each part of the structure that he goes through, he's challenged with even more, uh, the stakes get higher for him. Um, he becomes more and more desperate. He's given circumstances become more and more terrifying and violent. And I don't know, Penny, if, if that made sense, what I said, do you, do you think that this is particularly unique to capitalism? This idea of um, 
it's able to exploit and violate yet at the same time kind of I don't know what the word is like convince everyone that everything is fine does that make sense well, I think it, you know I, I can't I, I don't think I can speak for feudalism in the same way but I but certainly capitalism has 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 made an art of if you like you know what Gramsci talked about hegemony the idea that the the ruling ideas are the ideas of the ruling class the ideas that we hold in our heads about competition and and success and profitability are somehow good concepts and and good aspirations and healthy aspirations when the reality uh, is quite the reverse and so capitalism produces uh you know, it, it is an economic structure um, but it's an economic structure that produces a whole set of superstructures that, that Marx sort of, you know, alluded to. So the whole education system and a, a system of religion and so on, which reinforces, they all serve to reinforce the wholesomeness, if you like, of capitalist social relations of production or capitalist economic relations of production and the social relations that they then produce. So there is a sense in which we are ideological victims as well as economic victims. I mean, and I'm not speaking for myself because, you know, I am one of the privileged, but the vast majority of the, the world, uh, the, the vast majority of people in the world are victims of capitalism, I think. And um, yet nonetheless, I always remember teaching um, in my first lecturing job at university and I, talking to a crimin criminology students and thinking about Marxism and a Marxist account of criminology and criminality. And, and they'd all say to me, yeah, no, no, it absolutely makes sense. I mean, Marxism makes sense. It, it explains the system really well, but it, socialism can't work. You know, it, it can't, you know, it, it makes sense theoretically, but that's, that's the limit of it. So it is a hard one. It's very hard for people to move beyond the, the sphere of the present and what they know and what they, with their place in the system to imagine um, socialism or to imagine a world which does not um, rely on class exploitation and, 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 and so on. So I think, yes, that you were alluding to, you know, ideological practices which state structures themselves produce and I can completely understand um, the, the, that, that relationship is extremely powerful and it's hard for people to break free of it and they normally only ever break free of it um, in circumstances of struggle quite frankly there are few people who intellectually can can grasp um, the value uh, of or a critique of capitalism and the value of a different form of society. But unless you are really on the front line, unless you're on a picket line, really defending your job, defending your, your wages, defending your conditions, then it's much harder. It's much harder to think beyond what we have because the way we've been educated and the way we've been socialized is, is, is all about, this, is, this system is a given. Capitalism is a given. Well, it's not. It's not very old, you know. Capitalism is, is a young economic system. Um, but nonetheless, we are conditioned to believe that it is the only way. And almost the natural way, right? Like, this and is how human beings are. Like, you mentioned earlier, it's the typical excuse of, like, yeah, socialism um, looks beautiful on paper. Or another one, another typical comeback I hear is, um, socialism works fine with 15 people in a field. <laughs> like, um, and often a lot of arguments or discussions that we have in Romania when we're in Romania and we're discussing these, these ideas is that well, while, while we live through socialism, we live through communism um, and we know that it doesn't work. But there are not that I would ever um, claim to have experienced that hardship. But the, in, within Romania's case, there were a number of other things to consider that economically speaking, Romania was always a state capitalist country uh only the people were forced to live under the ideology and the ideology wasn't even that of socialism but of stalinism which was particularly hostile and romania was the only country in the whole of europe that didn't go through de-stalinization in the late 50s um and so they stayed up until 18, 89 with stalinist uh, policies but yeah like i remember my parents telling me that they grew up eating 
canned fruit and peas that were canned in Romania. So the Romanian people were forced to starve and live on rations, yet all those products were sold. So the, the economic system within a lot of um, the, the, the communist countries up until 89 were actually state capitalists. So the economic violence was still there in, in, one, in one way. So I wanted to come back to a point that you made, Penny, and, and link it to you, Matthew, which was th this idea of breaking free from the ideological kind of framework or structure or even prison of capitalism. And I wanted to ask you, it, with six years of retrospect, uh, whether you think the, the, uh, the student does break free in the end. <laughs> I, j I was just watching just before um, we began our discussion, I was just watching the, the final speech of the student. And it's really interesting to watch it this with six years of retrospect because to be honest, I know that now in your process, which I think is very interesting, you do a, this process of de-rolling. Um, and as I was watching this, me doing the speech, I was thinking, oh, I don't know if I ever really properly de-rolled from this. <laughs> um, and I, 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 what I mean by that is that um, I st I'm still, that was the first time I'd, you know, I've seen the recording before, but it was the first time I'd really looked at it with sort of my first feelings of a little bit of objectivity, not actually looking at it from sort of within the student's point of view and thinking, actually, yes, you know, <laughs> he's right, <laughs> he's starving, <laughs> what's he supposed to do? Um, but I see him sort of standing there saying, you know, I believe in the Western truth. And it really strikes me, and you, you mentioned before, you, you said something about approaching this perhaps crudely, approaching this idea of capitalism perhaps crudely, which I think is interesting because I think that capital, it sort of relies on this uh, almost like a smoke screen, screen of complexity when at the heart of it there are some extreme, it, it, so there, are, there are some things about it which are extremely crude in and of itself. I, I, you know, I knew nothing really about the system before we started working on this so i think we were all going at it with like this brand new kind of wow look at look at what the, look at this truth that we suddenly like we're, we've all we felt like we'd all had this wool you know lifted from our eyes or something um but i i see somebody standing there who almost more than his need to eat or his need to find the money is someone who is needs to protect their reality. Someone who almost is driven to these lengths because um, it's the, it would be the revealing of the fantasy or the, the um, finally seeing through the facade or something that that, that is really the, um, the thing that the student cannot accept perhaps this thing that he has surrendered to this kind of idea that he's surrendered to to suddenly realize oh well you know that was a lie i've been lied to and i have been complicit in this lie um affects somebody at the at the level of identity of, of their identity that so much is built on this thing that to admit that that foundation is um has a big crack in it or something is almost unacceptable to your idea of self or something. Um, yeah, was that was that towards your question at all? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I was just I was just thinking, kind of, what whether I mean, some audience members felt differently uh, in different countries and different venues that we played in. Um, but this idea of not that it's justifying his act of violence, but whether at least once when we were touring it and traveling, whether you felt any form of liberty post murder or even actually post, not post murder, but post not finding what you'd gone into the, the pawnbroker's uh, house for and whether there was a kind of more of an emotional liberty or that 
again, coming back to this idea that you, you talked about the crack in the foundation, mm. because, you know, Dostoevsky wrote a lot about um, people exploring and searching for um, freedom, whether it was freedom from religion or freedom in religion or through economic um, policies or even terrorism, as he wrote in The Demons. So I just wondered whether that was something that you've ever thought about, because for me, watching it night and after night, there was always a moment of freedom, but maybe the character doesn't find it actually. And actually it's more to do with the interaction with the audience, which we had wonderful ones, which I'd like to come on to. But mm. I don't know whether you had anything else you'd like to share with that on that point. Yeah, I mean, that's really interesting, that relationship with the audience. I think it's almost slightly going down a separate route, but there is something about the, the, the fact that the student is alone and this idea of individualism. And um, when the student, it's, it's so conflicted, isn't it? Because um, the student stands there sort of trying to defend individualism whilst also trying to reach out his hands to the audience and ask for their help. Um, and yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't, it, it, it all feels so desperate, you know, I, 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 I really would love to know what happens to him next, I suppose. Um, because we almost deliberately didn't look at that or think about that, you know, do the police arrive? Does someone in the audience call the police? I think we had threats of that shouted in some audiences, you know, um, yeah i think i think it's i think it's just very very conflicted as to i think it's you know in the recording you see the student go and even ask for your help nico would you put the lights on and it's like there's just this this false sense there's been this sense of control and it's like here's somebody realizing how little control they have perhaps how how controlled they have been and I think that's where you leave the student is in this like um, liminal space between understanding and having some kind of, I don't know, you know, some kind of um, epiphany about something. Be interesting to meet him in six years time. Mm. Yeah, that's very true. I don't know, Amanda, do you have anything you would like to say on that? Uh, well, uh, yeah, uh, just, just to add to that and obviously, again, reinforce what Matthew is saying, um, it, it, it's, it's, it was it's sort of, it's very interesting how every character has like their own position and their own, uh, yeah, sort of place in the, the capitalist structure and how the hero let's say uh which would be the student uh has this incredible journey on on failing at it you know on failing at what he believes and yeah um yeah uh, so so for, for me like playing uh, the girl, which was like directly affected with her not with her not being able to do anything around her to change her uh, life or surroundings, uh, and with the mother being a direct part of 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 this advantageous way of dealing with the structure. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very interesting to, to think about the student afterwards. I, I, I love that. I mean, that, that's, that's an, another book and another play. Uh, but yeah, just, just that. Well, of course, the rest of the novel, because we only did up to the first 70 pages of the novel, the rest of the novel is the student dealing with his guilt and then actually being sent off to a gulag um, okay. so for his punishment. So he's, in, he's in prison, right? So he... Mm -hmm. he is freedom and I suppose that's the that's the interesting thing that we're talking about here is what what is what is the freedom that we have we have the freedom of choice you know this is Milton Friedman's thing but is it is it a sort of freedom, freedom? <sighs> is it um yeah 
some kind of panopticon that we all live in this kind of yeah there is of course the freedom well the revolt the act of free will of the actors at the end to refuse to listen to not to freedom anymore and that is a different mechanism of the blurring between fictive character and actual actor activists as we call them the mm. um to a point uh, but that brings us me kind of beautifully onto the the audience so when i think back to crime i do think about some of the most amazing interactions with audiences uh, to give some brief examples in london i don't know if any of you remember but when we were playing in camden um, an audience member threw money onto the stage in the final scene uh, to see what you would do with it to try and help you um, in romania we had um, we had somebody actually have a dialogue. In fact, there was a reviewer that night and most of the review was just them transcribing this unbelievable dialogue between you, Matthew, and, and the person having a conversation with you saying, I don't agree with what you did, but I understand why you did it. Mm. I don't agree with violence, but I totally, I'm not, I'm not here in this space, in this previous position as an audience member to judge you. And I remember, you know, and I think, and that really, I think it was this, this is one of the strongest points of this show for me as an artist and as an activist, I have to say, um, of understanding what actually art or theatre has a, a, in a role of, of social change and promoting social change. And, and what, it re, what it really made me to interrogate, which is a question I'm still forever interrogating with every single project I do, which is what is the role of the audience? audience comes has the root word into here and actually there are lots of lots of um, um kind of radical theater theorists and philosophers that talk about how actually political theater one of the, the key defining things of political theater isn't the content necessarily but also its relationship with the audience and to change the role of the audience from somebody passive to a participant or a spectator uh, I think participants sits more comfortably with me and it's about actually just not putting the audience in a voyeuristic position but actually getting them to engage on many le different levels with the content and the, 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 the live performance being um, presented to them. And so I wondered whether you two had anything else before I come to Penny with my next question regarding linking this to that but uh, whether you had any particular moments of like audience interaction that have kind of stayed with you um, with this production. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, absolutely. It was, it was very interesting to, to have, you know, to perform it in London and have like a, a British audience where, I don't know, at least personally, I felt that I had more sort of, power in telling them something and more confidence into doing that uh, and when when we went to Romania it was like you know it, before every show he, he was like Whoa, what are what are we about to do what are we about to say how are they going to receive it um, and I don't know like uh, British audiences are a little bit more sort of quiet and and they would I don't know. There was there was fewer interactions, I guess, than than they were in in Romania. In Romania, it was like they had a conversation with you. You know, uh, when when I would ask for money, they were like, "No, I'm not. I'm not going to give you money, or I'm not. I'm not going to give the shoes to your son." Or, for example, I I I remember one moment clearly where when I was playing the girl and I went sort of to hide into someone's legs and. You know, and and they were, they were there for me. You know, uh, they embraced me, and which I, I found it very interesting. The involvement of the audience, which I think is the most important thing. In and they held your hand. No, is that the same night where the person held your hand? I remember seeing that from where I was operating. I was like, my God, that's 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 incredible. Yeah, and it was they... genuine. It wasn't forced. It wasn't. Yeah. No, uh, it was. Uh, it was a. Well, it was a beautiful moment of, of, of uh, I guess, complicity between the, the audience and, and the performer, which, which was really nice in the way that 
it, it felt real, you know. It felt it felt really like they wanted me to be well, um, which I guess we all do with a with a child. Uh, but yeah, the difference between the audiences, it, it, I, fa I found it very, very interesting. And, and again, I think that, that is the most important thing that I feel that crime has done, which the, the interaction with the audience and the relationship that we had on telling that, sto that story um, with the audience. Uh, you know, that conversation that we were having constantly, uh, e even like, you know, at the beginning of the show, the lines are delivered directly to them, you know, looking at them in, in the eyes, uh, which is uh, sort of goes against uh, our sort of classical training. But uh, yeah, it, I, it, that's one of the things that I love the most about the show, uh, which was the direct impact that it had on the audience and the direct impact that the audience had on you on stage night by night. Uh, so uh, it was, yeah. It was so. It was very tense. It was very. It was. It was. It felt like everything was boiling and something was about to ex explode every night. Um. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Ankel. Um. What about you, Matt? Have you got anything that you'd like to add to that? Yeah. I mean, just listening to Ankel's example of the somebody taking your hand and, um, being pulled into the action and contributing to it actively you know um it's not like the kind of pantomime like i'm here in the audience and i can say something to you and be safe um it's i mean i remember begging for food and being and it's it really still hits me actually i can feel myself the um so it's so moving that someone would feed me you know that the food out of their back um and but but sort of thinking about the theater of this it was the first time that i'd certainly ever worked in a context where you spoke to the audience and of course we kind of trained to make a connection with the audience if we speak to them but i'm not so sure that we're trained to um, expect a response um or actually demand one you know that we're not moving on from this until um until you know i'm speaking to you like can i have the answer please <laughs> can you help me please uh for real and of course that feels very risky as an actor uh because you genuinely don't have any control and of course that's what you want to do as an actor or even as a person is control everything and you really give up that um but that is liberating and that is exciting i mean you it means that you obviously it demands something different of you as a performer. Um, it demands a kind of investment that goes beyond just knowing your lines. You know, it means that you have to you have, you have to understand the argument of the character um, and of the play, I suppose. Ultimately, and maybe that's not the argument of you, the actor. So that's really interesting thing to encounter as well as to be able to. Um, stand without judgment and to really make that argument um, as if from the point of view of the character that's that's exciting and that's kind of weird <laughs> well and that comes that comes to something Ankel mentioned earlier i think it was Ankel um being connected being so very deeply connected to the idea as opposed to the individual character itself and i think that's at the heart of what we do with besna and obviously that was uh, very much inspired by brex ideas um yeah in the mid 20th century. Um, so on that discussion, uh, Penny, with um, um, the audience, now, since we had the honor of kind of joining ISKI um, as visiting fellows, something that I've been very inspired by reading your work, reading and other colleagues at ISKI and, and all their work is the role of civil society. And I know that you have a, um, a lot of experience with working with civil society and doing civil society actions yourself and how it, the intersection between law, intersection between criminology, state crime studies and civil society. Um, and so I wanted to, I'm wanting to build kind of like an image between how theater comes in. But before we start that, would you be able to give us a kind of 
a clear kind of definition of what civil society is and should do or does? Please. Um, sure, sure. I mean, I think civil society stands effectively between the sort of the individual and, 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 and our social sort of personal lives and the state. Now, you know, there's a view that civil society is always progressive and it deals and, and you know, monitors state actions and it's, a, it's about protecting human rights. And, and that, but it's much more complex than that. I mean, civil society can be a real force for reaction. Um, as we see in, in as we see in Burma, for example, so during the genocide of the Rohingya uh, Muslim minority, civil society uh, just stood right back. They, in fact, they they didn't stand back. Many sections of civil society inside Burma contributed to the genocide, contributed to the hate campaigns against the Rohingya. But civil society is a space. I mean, this is what. Antonia Gramsci talks about it creates a space in which an arena in which challenges to the state can be made and the forces of reaction can 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 if you like offer a countervailing force. So I think it's a kind of it's a fluid space, but we can take advantage of it. And I think if we want to tackle the kind of crimes that I'm interested in, state crimes, civil society is a much more powerful force than law, for example, than international law or the International Court of Justice or the International Criminal Court. If we want things done, we have to work with activists, with trade unions, we have to build civil society sort of movements and, and exactly that is happening against the coup in Burma right now, the civil disobedience movement. And many of the people who are now fighting against the military which conducted the final stages of the genocide are saying, actually, you know, we made a mistake. We should have stood with the Rohingya. I'm not sure how big that group is, but, you know, it's a fluid space. So I was interested listening to Matt and Uncle talk about their relationship to the audience and that immediate um, spirit which the, the play engendered and, and certain people sort of feeling so moved to want to reach out. To, to, to both of you, but I wondered, do you want it to go beyond the play? Because, you know, it's a very intimate setting. You have a small audience um, and that's the nature of left-wing productions, um, but they can be incredibly powerful as this play is. But, but is it enough? Is there something that you want to do beyond the setting of the play um, to take these arguments forward. And I, Matt, you talked about earlier that this was really your first experience of political theater. Um, and as a political academic, somebody who wants to make a difference um, and to make an impact and how does our research and how does our, our work, how can we make our work more impactful? How can we begin to change people? Certainly through lecturing, you know, it's a very didactic form, but we, we might be able to change the ideas of a few. But as I said before, the, the, the power of sort of dominant ideology is, is, is probably more, more pressing than, than one voice in a lecture theatre speaking Marxism to law students. But one of the things that we try to do in, in our work at the International State Crime Initiative is, is engage our ideas and our research and feed it into civil society and feed it into activist groups. Um, and so, but as actors, I wonder, I mean, I, you know, what you do after the play um, and, and do you take it into schools? Do you try to, um, make your ideas reach a, a wider audience than simply that that was visiting the, the play. Um, I, I, I mean, I can speak to that in, 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 in the most immediate way for me is that I, I'm also a, a teacher in drama schools. So um, I'm, I'm bringing this to the work that I have this uh, expectation of the students and, 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 and a big ask um, is to be asking what they're doing with their work. Um, I try to kind of bring that bring that in. Um, but I, but I, I, I really hear you and I think that that was something that we we certainly felt 
and talked a lot about when we were doing this was sort of what next, I suppose. Um, it strikes me in this six year window since we did the play, just how uh, foundational this seems to have been in, 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 in as, we've, as we've watched, I mean, you know, the most kind of vibrant example, obviously we, we, we're in it at the moment is the pandemic. And um, yeah, I mean, I've certainly, I've certainly felt in the more uh, existential moments of like, what are we doing? <laughs> Why are we doing it? <laughs> is 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 theatre where we can make an impact? Should we be out on the streets doing something else? Um, and I, I, you know, I don't know really. I mean, when all the theatres are closed, you kind of think, well. <laughs> Should we do something else? Um, and I've got friends who, who who have retrained and have gone into things, you know, much more, much, m f for example, you know, something like working in a, in a in a kind of very progressive tip, you know, actually looking at like the because this is a friend who could no longer watch the world burning and you know thought I can't make this impact in the theatre. I have to go and do something that's to do with the environment much more immediately. So, yeah, I don't know, I suppose. I don't know. Um, it wasn't a critique of theatre, because oh. I think actually it's incredibly powerful what you do. And, and, um, and, you know, you couldn't say crime was entertainment, which is <laughs> very often the way in which people receive theatre. It, it's, mm. it's something much more powerful. I mean, I think entertainment sort of, I'm not sure how impactful entertainment in and of itself can be. Um, and I think, yeah, I mean, teaching is, is certainly one really powerful way of, of, of doing that. Um, it's something that we, but we strike, it's, it's, we're quite similar in some senses, I think, academics and actors. <laughs> you know, you, you, you're preaching to a certain audience and... Uh, yeah, and, and that's, that's really interesting, isn't it? Because these, these are the people who've paid for their ticket and they've come to sit in the theatre and be, be spoken to. You know, they've probably seen some blurb about what it is that they're about to watch or they kind of have some idea. And so I think that was also a really interesting thing. You guys, when we were, when we were doing this was like, um, we're, we're asking or we're demanding of these people to watch somebody make a decision in this particular part of, you know, this particular environment or this, you know, for example, the, um, the mother who's forced to sell her child for sex. Um, and we there was definitely a lot of conversation about you know who are the people that really need to see this how can we get people to and i think that's a big question about the theater are the people that need to see it the ones that are actually watching it um which i think is something that is is a sort of a internal struggle that theater is always having or maybe should be having more i don't know um Absolutely. I mean, I'd like to jump in there a little bit, um, if you don't mind, Duncan. So for us, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's the eternal question. I hope it won't be eternal, Petty. Um, I hope that we can find an answer pretty soon um, in terms of like what the role of theatre is. Maybe I'm deluded. I have been criticised of that before, but I am absolutely convinced that theater, I have not, or Besna have not, and other people have not found theatre's full potential to be a tool of resistance and not just a space of reflection. Um, and I guess that's actually, this question was at the heart of why me and Sinziana decided seven years ago to actually found Besna, because we were sick and tired of the vast majority of British theatre at least being used as two hours for the middle classes to digest their pre-show dinner and actually it was kind of uh, very frustrating for us who were seeing kind of uh, various oppressions and, and violences intersect and nobody really questioning them especially in Britain where I think personally there is a very special type of British apathy towards a lot of this or blindness. Um, so I'd like to touch on the idea of so after post-crime when we, we start we then did five productions in Romania where we stayed out in Romania for five years and we were very much inspired by the, I have to say, a beautiful political movement out there. And um, a lot of people 
so there were two massive things that we were heavily inspired by working in the political movement in Romania. One, free ticket prices for social and political work. And I now feel that it's so almost immoral and wrong to charge people to come watch political or social work. So that wouldn't that made that changed our perspective of approaching funding. The funding model has to change. We need to be able to make sure everyone's paid and compensated and employed and everything's covered, but we do not depend on profit making. So again, it, it's us kind of stepping back from um, a system that was set up to produce profit. Um, and immediately audiences do become different. I can't say in, in England quite yet because it's a little harder uh, for us to get there, but at the moment we're trying to reduce ticket prices down to uh, the living wage of each city that we're on tour. So uh, for one hour, even if the show's two hours, it's just one hour of living wage for that um, area. Um, and then we also, at least um, a quarter of the seats are given for free to certain organizations that we work with or and the, you know, the, the communities that they work within. So ticket prices is one. And I think blood is another example of us believing that political theater is a civil right. And so actually, I don't know, maybe it's just me, but it's just weird to go, okay, I will pay to go and learn about something or to be questioned. I might not come out with that with a positive experience, but it's that interaction. Um, I do believe, and this is why I brought up the whole civil society question, because I do believe that I dream of making theatre that actually threatens the establishment. In terms of when the establishment know of its existence, they feel threatened and intimidated. And, and so in that regard, I don't mean that necessarily in a violent way, but I mean it in terms of we know what you're up to and we've got people watching what you're up to. And again, it, I think it comes back to this idea of civil society of going out, the field work, collecting the evidence and bringing it back to people, uh, which, you know, every second that I've uh, been in Niski, I've taken the opportunity to absorb and to learn about how that actually works. Um, and I guess, the other thing that you mentioned would, was getting audiences to ask questions. I mean, in my mind, I would love audience members to just have an impromptu protest, you know, as I heard of like many radical, fam radical feminists in the seventies in the States, uh, giving certain speeches on, on university campuses and people rising and, and protesting. That is my dream. But until we get to that point and I find how that is done, I mean, we would just obviously be constantly criticized as we already have been of producing agitprop. But, you know, I've learned to take that as a compliment now, as opposed to a criticism. <laughs> uh, if the middle class white man who is reviewing the show calls it agitprop, actually, that's a compliment because I pissed him off a little bit and he's, he, he's uncomfortable with what we're saying. But yeah, as like theatre as a way of taking part, a, take a safe, an open space, not a safe space necessarily, but an open space where a community or various communities can see a violence being deconstructed. And then we can rehearse together resistance. It's very ideological, I'm aware of that, but like that's kind of how I always approach each project differently, et cetera. And so on that, um, I didn't know whether like your, because I'd like to point out um, Penny, um, the incredible work Iski did um, in, uh, uh, the Rohingya um, genocide years ago. And I'd like to point out that Iski was one of the only people in the uh, organization of the entire world that collected that evidence of the genocide and made it public and took the courageous, brave steps to say there's a genocide happening. Other huge organizations were not doing that. And so I don't know whether, if you feel comfortable, Penny, just to have a few words on that experience, uh, because I think it ties beautifully into this whole civil society conversation. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Nico. Um, we we had been in Burma doing a, a different project actually on civil society, and we had heard about some violence that had ta was taking place. This was in two thousand and twelve, and we'd heard some, about violence that had been taking place in the west of the country in a really remote part, Rakhine State, and so against the Rohingya Muslim minority. And I got to meet a few Rohingya in Yangon at the time, and it seemed to us that something really terrible was happening. This wasn't intercommunal violence as the state was painting it or as the West was painting it. And we, um, 
we applied for some funding to, to go and do sort of more in-depth research. But we did write to the British government at the time saying, we think that there's a genocide happening on the basis of the work that we've done so far. Um, and, you know, the British government should be doing something about it. Um, and then we were told, well, there's no evidence base. So we, by Hugo Swire, actually. So we went to Burma, we got the evidence. We interviewed about 175 different people, Rohingya, Rakhine, state officials, business people, um, and got a really good, clear understanding of what was going on, wrote the report, um, submitted it to Boris Johnson, in fact, who told us it's not a genocide until a court of law pronounces it as such, which is, which is just really good, a, a perfect justification for why we don't, don't have any faith in international mechanisms of justice. You know, if you, if you want an international court to determine something as genocide, wait 30 years, wait till the genocide has taken place, wait till the annihilation is over, wait till there are no Rohingya, you know, Myanmar Rohingya. They'll be in the diaspora, but they will not be in Myanmar. So um, we did that. Um, and it was difficult because we were, you know, as, as you said, Nico, when, you, when you're fighting against the grain, um, they're not interested. So the Today program on Radio 4, who I have been interviewed in the past, but they're not interested in it because they want, they, they want to go to the people who are much more sort of government sort of sources or organisations like Amnesty or Human Rights Watch, which still don't call it a genocide, I have to say. <laughs> you know, um, Amnesty calls it an apartheid. Uh, regime and um, Human Rights Watch called it uh, ethnic cleansing and a crime against humanity. But, but and they avoid genocide for very, very political reasons because once a determination of genocide is made, there is an obligation on the part of the UN and, the ver and states to actually intervene to prevent and punish. They're okay with the punishment bit years and years, decades later, but they are absolutely not willing to. Um, to deal with the question of prevention. So yes, I think, um, you know, we made a prediction in our 2015 report because, you know, we use Daniel Fierstein's work and that's where theory and practice come into being. If you've got a really good understanding of genocide as a process, which was the theoretical model we adopted and we used a lot of Daniel Fierstein's work and sort of a six stage model of genocide we could see what was happening. You know, it begins with stigmatization and, and early instances of violence, segregation and isolation, mass violence, systematic weakening before the mass violence, and then and then states engage in something which is all about rewriting the history of a place and rewriting the victim population out of that history, transforming the physical environment as if the Rohingya never lived there. It's, it's a bit like Palestine, Israel, Palestine, you know, villages, Palestinian villages, which were destroyed during the Nakba, um, where, you know, the Jewish state then plants trees, a forest over that village, renames a village, or uh, completely erases the identity of the population that, that, that were once there. So that was having a, that model, a theoretical model of genocide as a process allowed us to sort of to talk about it much earlier than waiting for the, the spectacularized mass violence, which we saw in 2017, which then meant more, more people felt comfortable about calling it a genocide then, because they want to see thousands and thousands of people dying before they're prepared to call it a genocide, which is a complete misunderstanding of, of what genocide is. So, um, and you know, it was, we worked through civil society in order to get the message out. Um, but it, as I said, it was very difficult to to do anything with civil society inside Myanmar because it was it was dangerous and because they took the state the state position that the Rohingya were in fact illegal Bengali immigrants, effectively. Um, and so, um, yes, but civil, you know, I mean, we do still see civil society as the most progress potentially progressive force, the most. No effective way of challenging state criminality and state structures of violence, um, but it's not. It's an up. It's it, you know you have to work hard at it, and 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 theatre will also have to work very hard at it as you are doing. And I think it's wonderful because you will change people's minds. You will change 
you will change the way they approach certain questions and theatre is all, you know, your kind of theatre is about asking people to raise those questions, to not accept what they have been given. Uh, so I think it's, you know, hugely important. And I think that one of the reasons it is we love working with Besner is because it's another civil society, it's, it's another way of reaching audiences. It's another way of thinking. And you think differently a little bit, you know, you think more creatively than we do. And it's a, and, and, and about reaching audiences in a, in a really challenging way that, that um, we are less familiar with. So it's a, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful collaboration from my perspective. Thank you so much, Penny. Um, I just wanted, I wanted to ask you a quick question before, because we have to wrap up soon, unfortunately, but for those that are watching uh, that, and that are interested in maybe like exploring, experimenting or developing their, their political creative practice, I would say that evidence and research is the key, key aspect. For us at Besno, we do a minimum of six months at least, and sometimes for certain projects, that just, just doesn't even scratch the surface. Based on your direct experience um, in, in Burma and with the Rohingya, I was wondering what kind of like, what forms did your evidence take exactly? And maybe some of the, the people in the audience can take inspiration from that. I suppose the, the evidence we, we gather, we, you know, we, observation and, and interviews and so on, but in order to kind of make some sense of the data that we gathered, we had to put it together in a report. We had to write it. So we have a, the theoretical framework I talked to you about as genocide, genocide as process, and then really presenting it in a way that was as convincing as possible. And, and so, so in our report, we went, the first report was, okay, we're, we're at the fourth stage of genocide, you know, and if we don't take care and if we don't intervene and if, if something isn't done we will see the mass annihilation stage next followed by symbolic reorganization of the society the, the final two stages which you know the final stage is all about sort of denial and the way in which states if you like make real their denial and so I think it's about getting the data into a form which makes sense which is compelling which has a clear argument and it has, if you like, a, not a blueprint for action, but some kind of, you know, we should do something about this. And this is some of what we can do, you know, in terms of like supporting a BDS movement, boycott, sanction, divestment um, strategy, for example, uh, as has been, was so successful in South Africa against apartheid, is very powerful in Israel, Palestine. Um, and is beginning now, this, the, the CDM movement in Burma is calling for, for, for precisely a BDS type um, engagement. And that's a way of pulling people in using your evidence, using, okay, we have the evidence here. Um, we've got to do something. Historically, this is the most effective way we can intervene. Um, we have to build and it's about political organization then it's about securing support and, and building, um, um, yeah, organization effectively so that um, people then can, can become part of something bigger um, and know what to do that is effective, that, 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 can, that can elicit social change. Absolutely. And we're always thinking about ways of like trying to find those concrete um, activities that we're building towards as you said I, I mean I started before the pandemic to toy with the idea of like building a lot more communication and relationships with trade unions as well uh that is not an original idea I have to say like Piscator the person who was a political theatre practitioner who came before Brecht a German um, political theatre practitioner he actually um, in his seasons would sell get unions to commit to buying like 400 seats per season and so actually half the theatre were always filled with unions and stuff um again go down the tree road but i think definitely this idea of like collecting your evidence i have to say out of all forms of research and evidence speaking to the people directly and first hand testimonies are particularly powerful um, artistically speaking and of course more importantly uh, in terms of actually getting the alternative narrative uh, the real narrative of the, of the working people um, and then and making sure that it goes down to that concrete form. 
um, building towards a concrete action. Uh, it's always good to remind ourselves of this, especially with the pandemic. Uh, Matthew and Ankel, I wondered uh, before we close, um, if you wanted to add anything or if you wanted to mention anything before we um, wrap up tonight's conversation. I was just thinking uh, towards the, uh, uh, as Penny, you were speaking there, um, about uh, this, this direction that your work seems to have taken, Nico, which is, you mentioned it before about rehearsing for the moment, sort of, um, or it seems to me a sort of a preparation for when you might be needed to actually take action or something. And it just strikes me from my perspective, which is mostly now, um, although I still work as an actor, it's I, I work a lot in movement and movement for actors. And um, the, the embodied nature of what you ask of the audience, or more and more, I see that there are these moments or potential moments in your work where the audience aren't just, um, and I suppose that's interesting that it sort of feels like it maybe started during crime with these small things of taking a hand or these very physical, um, phys the physicality of this. Um, and I know in my work with you on Illegalized, this, this um, moment where the audience were called upon to uh, stop the um, stop the plane in, in, in a in a can you tell me what you can you tell me deportation what? to get the audience to stop yeah. the old deportation exactly um, and they actually have to stand up and you know virtually they have to take hands I mean they, they sort of do um, that actually getting these things into people's bodies and I think that's one of the dangers of the pandemic is that we and I see people's lives and people's political lives being so lived out online that, um, that, that, that more can be done as a rehearsal, like we should be practicing when we can and that that should be really in our bodies. That's what I'm thinking. Oh, wow. I want to get into a rehearsal room right now and <laughs> start exploring that, man. Absolutely. Anka, is there anything you want to say? Add to that. Um, well, no, I, well, I, yeah, I would, I would like to add just how, how this, how this, how this way of working affects, uh, artists in a, in a way, I don't know, I don't know how to say it, but it, 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 it affected me in a way that, uh, as I said in the beginning, now, now I, I only try and and do this sort of work in a way and trying to have try to have the same impact in a way and going back to penny's uh question like how how do we take it further how it's been six years since crime and or something yeah six years um and and crime is is something that always lives uh, sort of with me artistically and personally in and what, it's more of a question for me. Like we know, we know the atrocities of the socio socioeconomical system that we live in, and and we know the consequences of the abrupt change in some countries. Uh, but and I I would have to requote uh, Luz Emilia Aguilar Sincer, which was on a earlier glot. I think she was in the first season uh, where she says that. Um, probably the, the political system is never going to change. Politicians are always going to be politicians, but societies need to change. Uh, uh, and that's the only given, uh, you know, that so society is in constant evolution. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, it's more of a question that I that I want to ask, that I want to ask everyone, like, wh wh where do we go from here, knowing that this socio socioeconomical system doesn't work uh, for the masses? Uh, what and and obviously having uh, so socialist uh, qualities in in the way you move society, it can be very helpful. But as we know the predatory aspect of the 
of of capitalism and the 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 people in power not allowing it to change because they have the power what is the step forward it's more of a question than adding to uh the conversation but what is the step forward I would like to requote Penny what she said and um, say that building or, and, or, um, and organizing, building organizations, building solidarity. And I, I was just thinking for this from an artistic point of view, but I think it also comes down to activism. So, for example, to use Besna and Niski as an example, neither of us working in isolation and actually finding sinews of solidarity between each other. Um, and sometimes um, I can say with some of our other partnerships, putting some uh, issues that we don't see eye to eye to a side yeah. and actually going to the main point that we need because because we can we you know if we're if 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 the establishment manages to keep us divided and conquered they then we're the conquered right whereas actually we're more power than them and we have to find ways and I think this is where art can actually come in really really usefully is is building sinews of connection and stability between communities, between people, between individuals. Like I've, I've had the honor of a number of times, not enough, unfortunately, but being in a room where the audience is filled with people that would never have been sat next to each other in, in, in any other circumstance. And it's, it's really incredible, the conversations that can happen. Um, so that would be my answer. Mm. Anyone else? <laughs> I mean, it, it, Nico and I were speaking about this recently, but yeah, it really strikes me that that is the, that seems to be the the most hopeful way forward. I hope not just an ide ideological way forward, but this thing of um, looking for even the one thing we agree on and allowing that to be enough to work together because um, I see a lot of, uh, um, I see a lot of kind of inability to get past certain things in other people that, that keep us, just keep us kind of chasing our own tails or, you know, there's this, this, this thing in the left that you see it kind of consuming itself. And sometimes I feel like the other side are kind of watching and laughing and just go, Lee, you know, like, ha ha ha, oh, look at them. <laughs> um, so, yeah. That's, I agree. Mm. I think it is about united fronts and really working at, at all level, but not all levels. I mean, it used to be, I used, would always have argued in the past that building a revolutionary socialist party was the thing to do, but the left is very fractured at the moment. And, and it's actually, I think it's quite demoralizing in, in, in lots of ways. It won't always stay this way. Um, you know, people people do resist and people fight back and um, it depends on, you know, you can't always predict when it's going to happen. Nobody predicted when the, the Berlin Wall would fall when it did. Um, but it is about being organised because without organisation, struggles just dissipate. And, you know, I think the Arab Spring was a really good example and tragic example of that. Um, so I think it is about one has to think very seriously about the nature of the organization and what one wants, you know, and that is, we do have to read, we do have to, it's not just about struggle, it's about understanding and um, the way the world is and what, what we want to, to, what we want about it to change. Um, so I think it's a combination, but a united front is definitely what we want against the evils of capitalism. And that is the perfect place to end tonight's discussion, honestly, and <laughs> Blood Series 2, United Front on the Evils of Capitalism. Thank you so much. Um, unfortunately, we have to finish there, but thank you so much again, Matt, Penny and Ankel, for joining us tonight and for such a stimulating conversation. I feel actually really stimulating, invigorated, as I said. I want to get back in the rehearsal room. Please. And on the streets. Um, thank you to our partners, HowlRound, for hosting Glud, uh, for the second time round, and F-Side Cine Club, Romania's first feminist cine club devoted to promoting films made by women. 
I'd also like to thank Un Teatro Theatre in Bucharest, Romania, where the recording of Cranberry's live stream tonight uh, was shot. It was shot there in 2014. And thank you for everyone who joined us tonight in solidarity. Uh, though tonight is the last live event of uh, the second season of Blood, I'd like to remind you that the whole of season one and two will be available to watch on How Rounds and Business website. Uh, the links should appear in our social media platforms and be sure to sign on to Business newsletter. You go on our website and you can sign up there for any updates on our projects that we're working on this year. We've got some really exciting things coming up um, this autumn um, and also uh, the next blood season. Um, so thank you once again, everybody. Uh, keep safe and inspired and always in solidarity. Thank you, bye.